<clears throat> what is up, YouTube? HPJ here. <clears throat> I've been under the weather, but I'm here with you guys to talk about some of my favorite decks over the last 10 years. So it's been a long period, uh, not only for just the channel, but for Yu Gi Oh! itself. And it's been a bittersweet experience, I can honestly say that. And for this video, it'll actually, it'll be a two part. Uh, I believe a three parter and just going over the years of the decks that I've played throughout the game and just my overall experience with each specific deck. Um, many I had to cut from this list just due to time period and just overall um, adjustment of what I played at that time. So I had to really scrimmage through a lot of things, really try to figure out where things were and just what I wanted to accomplish from set deck. Um, with overall alignment of stuff, I did pick enough of the decks themselves to actually see where I was going to go with the variations. So, I, I can't wait any longer. Let's just go through it right now. So, I'm going through years 2009 to 2012. It actually started off with Black Wings. Uh, this was pretty much one of the highest tier decks um, when I started playing the game uh, again. Or more so on a, a competitive level, or more so of a official level. Um, with Black Wings, for the most part, black they were dark attributes when getting inside monsters, and they were one of many of the archetypes that introduced um, players to synchros and tuner monsters, which was the new mechanic at the time. Not to mention the cut of the extra deck to 15, the large amount of support most decks got at that time for. Uh, the new mechanic, just like many other decks themselves, and it just throw around around and stuff that you could play in a deck that really got the deck feeling itself. I think, honestly, for the most part, when it comes to Black Wings, my most interaction with Black Wings is just it was either it was always pure Black Wings, it was never anything really jumbled up. I think that wasn't until Vayu himself came out, and when the Emblem Honor came out, that's when the deck itself sparked up. Um, it was already winning events and tournaments, and then at that point, the band list started hitting it as hard as it possibly could. I don't think I really played much of it as a setup type of deck. I think most of the part, I just had the cards. I ended up building the deck itself, and then I had to build a whole other deck because the deck that I had at that time ended up getting stolen. So, going from building the variation of deck, like, this was a deck that I I. I floated to a lot outside of what people would know me traditionally for uh, would be playing Carpy Lady, but at that time I wanted to play something with a little more edge to it, a little more survive. And this was a really good deck, honestly. It, it had a lot of its good parts, it had a lot of its down parts, but I think for the most part, the most of the experience I got was from a lot of its members and the range of its members that did help uh, get a lot of itself off the ground. Because I have to say, I didn't enjoy the Black Wings in terms of the, the optimization, the customization, and just the overall appeal of the Black Wings themselves. Uh, and those Black Wings, just to mention, Sarako the Dawn, Bora the Spears, Ethos the Elite, uh, Kalut the Moonshadow, Gale the Whirlwind, Blizzard the Far North, Vayu the Emlo Honor, the spell card Black Whirlwind, and of course the Extra Deck Monsters, and my personal favorites, uh, Black Wing, Silver Wing, The Ascendant, Black Wing, Armor Master, and Black Wing, Armor Wing. So we move on from them, and we actually go on to the Fortune Ladies, uh, who was another archetype that I played at that time. The Fortune Ladies, for the most part, and even last until now, were very strong on the sense they had a lot of here and there of card supports, but it wasn't as strong as it is now, um, because most of your access was pretty much summoning Dark Eye Light, having Dark Eye Light get rid of monsters, or summon monsters from the deck through their own effects, and the, no, summoning monsters through their own effects, and then those monsters would correspond with their own effects to do things. If it wasn't Fortune Lady Fire, who blew up cards, it was Fortune Lady Water, um, who was drawing cards for you, uh, for the most instant where fire and water actually had a great combination with a lot of the support in the deck. And not to mention just the overall appeal of what the players at that time enjoyed about Fortune Lady. Sadly enough, Fortune Lady didn't get their tuner until literally 10 years after uh, their release in Ancient Prophecy, where we finally now have monsters like um, 
Fortune Lady Pass, who has her ability to be uh, to manipulate her level by banishing spellcasters in the graveyard or on the field or in the hand. And then, in correspondence with that, you can range the large amount of synchro monsters that you can summon off of her effect. I think when Master Rule um, 5 comes into effect, I think Fortune Ladies will have a big spark in terms of the variety that they'll be able to play without having to rely on weak monsters to do a lot of the supporting. Also, to mention the fact that they do have a really boss monster in the form of Fortune Lady Every, who just simply clears out the board herself. Like, she, she's really great in the sense that she's a boss monster who can summon herself. She can banish cards to summon herself, and then she can banish your opponent's monsters, which helps out tremendously. Um, so, to the lineup of the Fortune Ladies and the large amount of things, like, I can't really say just Fortune Lady, because I can go to Fortune Chaos, where I play Fortune Ladies with BLS and Chaos Sorcerer. I can go to Fortune Ladies, which includes Necro Face. The Necro Face is ability to face out was a strategy still then. Uh, it was more prevalent then than it is now, just because you do have to watch out for cards like a million eaters. Um, a million eater of a million which can be a problem, because that thing can get really strong. So, it, it just depends on how you build the deck, if you, if you can deal with a, a card or a situation that most game, most decks do um, promote at this point. Just be careful what you um, have to deal with. So, uh, the cards will line up with the Fortune Ladies, of course. Fortune Lady Pass, Fortune Lady Light, Fortune Lady Fire, Fortune Lady Water, Fortune's Future, uh, Fortune Vision, and Fortune Lady Rewind, and of course, the lovely Fortune Lady Every. Then we move on to Heroes. Heroes have always been a fan favorite, uh, for many of years since their release. The gimmick of the, of the Heroes is, of course, massive Fusion Summon. If it ain't Fusion Summon, then no other than take advantage of level or manipulation of field or grave and go into some weird and crazy tactics that have worked for them for years. We're talking about Little CD, Big CD, Gemini Hero, um, the full force of the heroes where they, you know, went to Bubble Beat. We have Airblade Turbo. We have variations of the heroes that have expanded through this entire series, even to their mass counterparts, which have made an appearance. And the extra deck being full of tons of more heroes, even the extra heroes who support the extra summons and the fusion summon that the hero archetype brings. Um, one of their biggest monsters, of course, as we all know, is the Elemental Hero Stratos, who for a long period of time has not seen um, three <laughs> since Airbully Turbo, or a little before Airbully Turbo, before she got limited, and then he was one of many of the heroes that did get banned, the other one being uh, this commander, but I didn't play around this commander's time because that's perfect circle. And when it came to heroes, I mostly played, you know, variation of the heroes at the time when Gemini he heroes was a thing because that was the elemental heroes plus Gemini support, uh, mainly involving cards like elemental hero Neos Elias, who at the time was only a hundred points stronger than Neo. I mean, in Shadows, but had the whole Gemini setup for himself where he became Elemental Hero Neos. But for the most part with this monster, because he because of his level, his access to the extra deck, and a lot of his support to the extra, his um Gemini support, like this monster really just became Gemini Hero. And you really saw a lot of the advantage it took in when it comes to monsters like Absolute Zero. For when the Omni Heroes hit the scene, that's where the hero setup really sparked up. You had a monster like Elemental Hero Absolute Zero, who could take any hero monster and one water monster, fuse them together, and bam, here's this monster. He gained 100 attack for each water monster in the field except for himself. And then for when you left the field, he destroyed every monster your opponent controlled. So when you do look at the newer combinations, when you have cards like Mass Change, which you swap out zero to make acid you got not only to clear the back row but you also got to clear the monster in in your opponent's uh in your monsters uh in your opponent's monster zones as well uh, but akin to the elemental heroes there were the destiny heroes which i did uh play a bit of uh, especially when it came around to malicious diamond dude and um, the effects of Dasher, and mainly just that was just all from cards like D-Draw, and D-Draw's ability to draw even more cards from the deck, and because of how Malicious was at the time, Malicious 
um, ended up getting himself limited, but semi-limited, just because of how powerful it was to have a set of Destiny draw, have a set of, um, have a set of Destiny draw, have a set of Malicious, take advantage of Absolute Zero, and just really take advantage of a lot of the synchros, because, uh, we do also have to remember Teledad was a thing at the time. Yeah, Teledad, I'm even going that far, too, um, when it comes to this. The hero lineup didn't stop there for me because I also did play Evil Hero. And Evil Hero was a more abrupt version of Fusion. But this was a ver- Fusion that took advantage of someone like a big monster like Malicious Edge. Who was able to be easily summoned um, if your opponent controlled the monster. Then you had cards like your um, Dark Fusion and Dark Calling giving you even more access. While Calling banished those monsters... From the field of the graveyard, you had at least dark fusion to set up the field or the, to set up the set up the field or the graveyard by sending those cards from the hand or field to the graveyard. And then, of course, one of my personal favorites was Elemental Hero. I mean, Evil Hero Dark Gaia, just for the fact that he forced every monster on the field to go in the every monster your opponent controlled to face up attack position. Um, he gained attack equal to the material that was used for his fusion summon, and he was more so fusion summon based off of types, not. Um, you know, being a hero, which was strange at the time, because you never would have thought, oh, there's fiends in the hero archetype, but yeah, there were fiends, there were tons of just dark monsters uh, ravaging around, there's just a lot of good support, the only card I forgot I'd add to add to this was super polymerization, um, and that was just, you know, just the hint of what heroes can do, or that can be point, was taking advantage of cards like super polymerization, and really taking advantage of the game itself, with a lot of the dice going out, and as the more support for heroes came, the more support heroes got. I mean, just look at the line- lineup they have. So, lineup of the heroes, of course, Evil Hero, Malicious Edge, Dash, uh, D-Hero Dasher, and Malicious and Diamond Dude. Then for the Elemental Heroes, of course, we have Neos Elias, Shadows, and Ocean. And then for the support cards of the monsters, we have... Support cards in general, we have, of course, e I mean, E-Call, uh, Miracle Fusion, uh, Hero City, A Hero Lives, Dark Calling, D-Draw, uh, Dark Fusion, and, of course, two of my favorites, uh, Elements of Hero Absolute Zero and Evil Hero Dark Gaia. Uh, we move on from the heroes, and we talk about the um, Grave Keepers. So, when it came to Necro Valley, this was a field spell that pretty much said no to the Graveyard. Um... Over time, of course, a lot of cards did get over this card just due to how this card was worded and how it was ruled. So once the wording and the ruling got um, got itself together, the deck itself managed to get itself together. I think, honestly, this was a deck that still has a lot of potential. It just, no one really knows where it wants to go. Does it want to go add time at a, does it want to... Um, take advantage of this new factor of having a fusion monster and take advantage of that. You, you really don't know with Necro Valley overall and the Grave Keepers. But this was honestly one of my favorites. And cycling like, enough, this was another deck that ended up being tier just off of the fact that it was Necro Valley, Royal Tribute, and then you had all these new monsters coming out like um, Grave Keepers Ascending and Grave Keepers Recruiter, who made the deck a lot more put into its search than anything. And then the fact that you had a monster who had the ability to type, to get rid of stuff that your opponent control. And not to mention you had cards like Spy who allowed you to summon a lot of your monsters. Even though it can summon copies of itself, you still had a lot of cards that you could easily get. Oh no, you could summon copies of itself. Um, you still had a lot of things you can easily grab onto and take advantage of. Even some high level monsters. And then as time itself went, then they started getting um, a lot more of the abrupt setup. I didn't like any of the monsters in Primal Origins, to be very frank with that. But um, I did like stuff that came in Soul Fusion. And you can see cards like uh, Great Keeper's Hexman and Great Keeper's Spiritualist, who were two monsters that helped in terms of getting monsters to the board and in Fusion Summoning. Especially considering the fact I did play a variation of Great Keepers that involved Shadows to get out Shadal Winda and take advantage of um, Fusion Summon. And the fact that with Necro Valley on the field, Great Keeper Spiritualist said, okay, get a Fusion, get a Spellcaster type Fusion Monster, uh, summon it to the field using me and monsters in your hand or field as the material while Necro Valley's on the field. And in that way, you can get into cards like Winda, because Spiritualist is dark, you all you need is the Shadal Monster. And then, bam, you have your, you have your Winda. 
or you take advantage of link summoning and card combinations with spiritualist and um not spiritualist, headsman and spy and then you really can get you know a ton of demons together the brightest side to this is looking at the fact that the archetype now has a boss monster in the extra deck we're looking at uh the keeper supernaturalist he's not as great keeper as esper in the ocg but for the most part i think supernaturalist is a great monster has a great um, effect on its own, where it'll gain attack and defense equal to the combined level of the monsters used for a fusion summon times 100. While Necro Valley's on the field, this card and any cards in your field spell zone can be destroyed by card effects. And if you can activate the effect of during your end phase, you can add a Necro Valley card or a card with a uh, Great Keeper monster uh, from your deck to your hand. So you have search, you have defense, and you have a monster that can be extremely powerful with the right card combination. So, um, the lineup of the Great Keepers, of course, Necro Valley, Royal Tribute, which has no card to search for it. The only reason why it was even, like, it's only part of it is because of the fact that it, it does have the setup for, um, the Great Keepers. And it was the only card, actually, within the archetype itself to ever be limited. Um, Great Keepers Spiritualist, Great Keepers Descending, Great Keepers Headsman, Great Keeper Recruiter, Great Keeper Spy, and Great Keeper Supernaturalist. So, we move on a little further. And we're actually going to end with 2012. Well, the main part of 2012 in terms of the two card, the two sets of cards that came out. So when that time came around, of course, we do have to talk about the Psychic Lock. Um, the Psychic Lock, for the most part, introduced cards of Serene Psychic Witch, her Psychic Cleric, and Asper Girl. The whole gimmick of the deck itself was to use utilize the abilities of um, have Psychic Clerk, who had the ability to send a Psychic type monster you control to the graveyard to special, to, um, put a card from, yeah, to pretty much put a monster in your graveyard, banish it, and then, uh, you would special summon that card when this card would leave the field. So in the combination of these three monsters, you also use the monster Mind Master, who at that time was at one, who's currently now forbidden because there's, um, there's a lock with him. And I forget, I think her name is Cam. Cam, the Serene of Gusto, and her ability, which is pretty much draw power. Um, she sends three psychic monsters back to your deck, shuffle, and you draw a card. And she's once per turn. She has no restrictions to her name, but the fact that you can attribute her off, so you'll get another variation of herself, and then um, repeat the process. Um, in combination, of course, with the um, Esper Girl, her psychic clerk setup, which was pretty boss, because you could utilize both. Um, her Psychic Cleric and um, Serene Psychic Witch and Asper Girl. Asper Girl was pretty much one of your big tuners because of the fact that she was ever removed, she can be special summoned, and then she placed the top card of your deck to the graveyard and she left the field, you can add um, that card that was banished back to your hand. Serene Psychic Witch was able to either go get her Psychic Cleric um, from the grave, yeah, to go get Cleric when she was sent from the field to the graveyard. Um, and that was the combination right there. So she would cards like Itali to speed up the process to get monsters. My variation used both um, telekinetic power well and um, telekinetic power, yeah, telekinetic power well and telekinetic charging cell. What you would do is you would equip this card to Mind Master, and because Mind Master um, was equipped with this, you wouldn't take any life points uh, every time you would activate a psychic monster's effect. Or the psychic monster's effect that was equipped with this card. So you would equip it to this to the mind master. You'd summon off of each heli, or you'd summon another monster in response. Then you make sure that um, you pretty much lock yourself into having all these monsters. You're filling up your hand. You're putting monsters onto the board, and then you go for an Eteria Beast and Barkeon. For that point, the Beast and Barkeon are pretty much just there um, to be monsters to negate spells and to deal with trap cards. Um, you can ultimately go for your ultimate goal, which was helping out summon uh, Formula Synchron, or for the biggest part, TG Hyper Librarian. For every time you Synchro summon, you draw a card off of this monster's effect, and then that would build up, and then you could build a monster like Shooting Star Dragon. And yeah, the combination there is bananas. There was so many different variations of this deck that just judged through to help get out to um, TG Hyper Library and Shooting Star Dragon, who at the time were not out yet. I believe they were, I know Shooting Star was out, but um, she wasn't. And then um, TG Hyper Library didn't come to July, and then I think at the time she came, both her and Formula Synchron uh, both hit the one status. Not to mention Trishula was also an option in case you 
um, just wanted to allow, just hit monsters onto the board. Because Trish was a great um, assortment to a lot of decks at that time. In terms of the Cinco Summons, in terms of just the overall way of putting monsters onto the board. And then the last deck that I do want to talk about, of course, is, well, Agents. Master Hyperion, Agent of... Oh, I'm sorry. Before I go further, I do have to read off those cards. Um, we have uh, Serene Psychic Wish, High Psychic Cleric, Esper Girl, Emergency Teleport, uh, Telekinetic Power Well, Telekinetic Charging Cell, TG Hyper Librarian, um, Stardust Dragon, Formula Synchron, um, Trishula Dragon of the Ice Bears, Neteria Beast, and Neteria Barkeon. Okay, now we move on to the agent. So, after waiting so many years for us to have a structure deck for like attributes, especially fairies, we end up getting it in the form of Master Hyperion's Lost Sanctuary. This was to pay homage to the fact that we did not receive those cards in that structure deck, even though the structure decks most of the time do clean out a lot of cards that the OCG gets, but TCG doesn't. Uh, for the kin of what this deck was, it was pretty much using a Master Hyperion to like special summon itself by vanishing from your hand or, or um, yeah, by banishing either an agent that was on your hand, in your graveyard, or on the field, and then having the abilities of the other monsters to support itself by banishing one of them, banishing a fairy monster to destroy a card on the field. Well, that introduces the Agent of Mystery, Earth. So this was when the Agent archetype itself grew and gave support to a lot of the fairy support that was coming. But this was one of the biggest jumps because now they have a tuner. Um, the Agent of Earth was the one who had the ability to search for any Agent monster and add it to your hand. If you control Sanctuary of the Sky, you were able to search for the man himself, Master Hyperion. Uh, Master Hyperion himself, if you can tell in his artwork, he has all of the uh, planets in his arch because he's actually part of the planet archetype in addition to supporting the Agent. Uh, but that's a whole nother kind of story. The Agent of Creation, Venus, uh, also takes the spark to this because Venus was one of your other primary targets with the Agent of Earth. And then that's where a lot of the major play setup comes in. For where Agent of Venus, where Venus has her ability to summon her mystical shine balls. And most people would not think that this was actually something that would be a kin. But once we went from synchros to exceeds, this is where a lot of the, the combinations really started popping off. Not just in the TCG, but in the OCG, because we all know the OCG just started supporting stuff first. Um, with the agent of creation, Venus, Venus was going to allow you to get your Mystic Shine Balls. You use the effect of um, Genex Ally Birdman, who sadly enough is not going to appear until next video. Where Birdman would be able to bounce back one of the Shine Balls, you use Venus to summon the Shine Ball again, and then you would synchro into a ton of monsters. Um, those monsters using those cards like Sardis Dragon, Trisha Dragon of the Ice Barrier, and really take advantage of having a field. With a high, with high level monsters, high level defense, and high level stat up. I mean set up. And you can also include um, Christia because Christia was able to be summoned uh, through a large portion of this as well for the four agents. But I I have a variation of agents that I went for that stretches beyond this. Um, but for the most part, yeah, that was the big lineup there uh, with the agents and the agents set up, especially considering the fact you had. Gachi who just came out, and Gachi at that time, people enjoyed Gachi for what he was, but Gachi got a lot more use for the decks that can make him, and the decks that can take advantage of having a monster who had the ability to not only protect himself, but for the fact that he gave monsters on the field additional attack bonus, which a lot of people laughed at the structure deck when it came out, but then when the structure deck stuff started hitting, it was laughing at face. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, when you take a look at it, I enjoyed what uh, came to be out of this. So, um, Master Hyperion, the Agent of Creation of Venus, the Agent of Mystery Earth, Mystic Shine Ball, Trisha the Dragon Ice Bear, Stardust Dragon, and Gachi Gachi Gintatsu. So, that ends the video here, you guys, for part one of um, my decades through video. I thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for watching. And part two will be right after this in the description box below. So, thanks everybody, and I'll see you guys next time.